Matthew chapter 15, going to talk about a mom with mega faith, a mom with mega faith. We're going to start reading in verse 21. Matthew 15 and reading in verse 21. The Bible says, leaving that place, Jesus withdrew. I want you to, to note that word. Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Those are towns in southern Lebanon. And look, a Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. But Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, Lord, send her away, for she keeps crying after us. But he answered, I was only sent to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. But he answered, It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that very moment. May God bless his word. Amen. How many of you wish you could get away from the cold right now and go someplace warm? Today isn't too, too bad, but it's been a little cold. If you could escape, where would you go? Would you go to the Caribbean? Would you go to Hawaii or Fiji or Bali? Or maybe the Mediterranean? In Matthew chapter 15, Jesus goes on a Mediterranean getaway with his disciples. From Galilee in northern Israel, he slipped across the border into southern Lebanon and went to the coastal region. It's very beautiful there. If you've ever been to California and you've seen the, the mountains and the Pacific Ocean and the beautiful uh, forests, the redwood uh, and softwood forests, that, that's very much what Lebanon is like. Matthew says that Jesus withdraws from Galilee. That word means to take refuge. Jesus is going away for a rest for a couple of months in the summer. He actually wasn't going to escape the cold. He was going to get away from the heat and go by the sea. But there are several reasons for this vacation. First of all, Jesus has just finished a very intense season of ministry in Galilee. The crowds kept growing and they kept pursuing Jesus so that Jesus couldn't get a rest. The Bible says some days he didn't even have time to eat. When his cousin John the Baptist was executed, Jesus tried to get away, but the crowds kept pursuing him so he couldn't even mourn his cousin's death in peace. Secondly, the controversy surrounding Jesus was rapidly intensifying. In the opening Verses of Matthew 15, Jesus goes 15 rounds with the Jewish religious leaders. And then there are those that are trying to politicize his ministry. Jesus came to start a salvation movement, but some were trying to hijack it and turn it into a political movement. And of course, Herod Antipas had just beheaded his cousin. And so there was imminent danger that Antipas might consider Jesus guilty by association. But I want, to, want you to know that more than any of those things, Jesus is getting ready to go to Jerusalem for the Passover. Jesus is getting ready to go offer his life on the cross as God's Passover lamb that takes away the sins of the world. He's getting ready for his final days of earthly ministry. Lent is beginning in just a couple of weeks in February, and during Lent we're going to be sharing a, season, a series called The Last Days of Jesus. Each Sunday during Lent, Pastor Nick and I are going to be looking at, at a different day in the Passion Week a little bit more closely. Every message is going to be about Jesus. There's going to be an opportunity at every service for people to believe on Jesus. So maybe you can begin praying now about who you're going to bring with you to church during Lent. But Jesus has just finished an intense season of ministry, and he's about to begin the most intense trial of his life, so he wants to take a rest. He wants to spend a little time with his closest friends, so he rents a house on the Mediterranean Sea, and he doesn't want anyone to know that he's there. 
Mark also records this same vacation. And Mark says that Jesus wanted to keep his presence a secret. But how many of you know when Jesus is in the house, it's impossible to keep it secret? Like perfume betrays itself, so he whose name is perfume poured out cannot be hidden. A mom on a mission finds out that Jesus is in the house. And she gives Jesus and his disciples no rest until Jesus delivers her young daughter from a tormenting spirit. You know, this mom is one of only two people that Jesus ever commended for having great faith, or or as it says in Greek, mega faith. Ironically, both people that Jesus commended for having mega faith were Gentiles. One was the Capernaum centurion that we talked about last week, a man with militant faith. Today, we want to talk about a Lebanese mom on a mission a mom with mega faith. We've been looking at stories of faith. We've been looking at some of the heroes of the Bible and considering the defining moments of faith in their lives. As a congregation, we've come to our own defining moment of faith. We're just a few short weeks away now from moving into our new sanctuary and fulfilling a dream that started 20 years ago. This last Friday morning, uh, we had a preliminary visit from the fire marshal. He walked through the building uh, doing a a preliminary inspection. The the fire marshal is the wild card in the whole building process because he has the authority, no matter what's drawn on the plans, no matter what's been uh, built or agreed upon, he has the authority to walk through and say, I don't like this, you have to change that, I don't like that. But the fire marshal approved everything in the new building. In two weeks, he's coming back with the building department, and the building department's going to have their preliminary inspection. And so we're getting very close to our temporary certificate of occupancy. I want to bring you an encouraging update this morning. You know, about six months ago, we needed a half million dollars just to finish the sanctuary level of the building. We needed another half million to finish the lower level. Honestly, we were about $1.2 million out. But because of your sacrificial giving and because the Lord has helped us to miraculously save money, the cash that we need now to finish the sanctuary is $40,000. That is amazing. Now, there's still about $80,000 of of equipment and acoustic panels that's not in that number that needs to go in the sanctuary. We we will need those, but we can move into the sanctuary, we can start using it, and we can put up with a little feedback if we have to until we can do that. The cost to finish the lower level is now about $100,000. I want you to know that from where we were six months ago to where we are today is an absolute miracle of God, and we give him all the glory. This is a time for faith, and when we need faith, the place to go is God's word. Looking at this Lebanese mom on a mission, I see three things that she shows us about mega faith. And I want to share them with you quickly. What does this mom show us about mega faith? First of all, this mom shows us what mega faith is like. She shows us what mega faith is like. When Jesus commended the Capernaum centurion and the Lebanese mom for having great faith or mega faith, Jesus was not referring to the quantity of their faith. He was referring to the quality of their faith. Beloved, listen to me. It is not the amount, but it is the potency of your faith that matters. That's why Jesus said, all you need is just a little bit of faith, just the size of a mustard seed, and you can move mountains. Someone who's been a believer in Jesus for just one day can have faith that is as potent as someone who has believed on him their whole life. So what are some of the qualities of mega faith? The the first thing this mom shows us is that mega faith is properly informed. 
Beloved, I want to tell you that mega faith is something far greater than just a sunny outlook. It's something far greater than optimism or positivism. It's far greater than hopefulness or resolve, as important as those things are. But, but mega faith is far greater than faith in the power of faith. Mega faith has an object, and that object is Jesus. The reason we're about to move into phase two is not because we believed that everything would somehow work out if we held on to hope. The reason we're about to move into phase two is because we believe that Jesus is more than able to keep his word when he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell won't stop it. <laughs> Mega faith is informed about Jesus. Last week, we talked about the Capernaum centurion who never saw Jesus, but based on what he heard, he believed on Jesus. In the same way, Mark says that this Lebanese mom heard about Jesus, and based upon what she heard, this Gentile idol worshiper came to believe. Both Matthew and Mark record that while Jesus was ministering in Galilee, Large crowds came down from southern Lebanon to see him. They brought large numbers of sick people to Jesus and he healed them. So the word about Jesus had spread to southern Lebanon and it reached the ears of this mom. And based on what she heard, she came to believe that Jesus is Lord. In Matthew's gospel, she calls Jesus Lord three times. In Mark's entire gospel, the only time Jesus is called Lord is by the lips of this Gentile mom. Lord means that she embraced his deity. She believed him to be something more than an ordinary man. She believed him to be someone supernatural sent by God. Based on what she heard, she also came to believe that Jesus is the son of David. It was known all over the Roman Empire and especially in neighboring Lebanon that the Jewish people were waiting for their Messiah. The prophecies about Messiah were widely known that, that he would heal the sick and feed the hungry and deliver the oppressed and set up a worldwide kingdom. She was a Gentile woman, but based on what she heard, she came to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Son of David means she embraced his earthly mission. She believed that he is the son promised by the Jewish prophets, that he is the seed of Abraham who would bring God's blessings to all the nations of the earth. Sure, there was lots she didn't understand yet about the incarnation and the hypostatic union. Jesus was 100% God and 100% man at the same time. There's lots we still don't understand about that, and we have a complete New Testament. But she believed in the heavenly origin of Jesus, and she believed in his earthly ministry. Beloved, that is the essence of mega faith. Mega faith is informed about Jesus. It has heard about Jesus, and it believes he is Lord, and he is the Messiah. What are some of the qualities of mega faith? Mega faith is informed, and this mom shows us that mega faith is intelligent. The, the crux of this story is the exchange between this mom and Jesus. After being rebuffed for the third time, she comes out with a witty reply that profoundly moves Jesus. We'll, we'll take a look at, at, at their banter in a minute, but, but this is what I want you to see. Beyond quick wit, the woman's reply reveals that she had done a lot of theological reflection. She heard about Jesus, and she meditated thoughtfully about what she heard. She compared the reports she heard about Jesus with the little bit of Jewish scripture that she knew. She heard about Jesus and she mentally inquired further about him. She thought about everything she had been told about the Jewish Messiah. Perhaps she even sought out conversation with others. What have you heard about the Messiah? 
Maybe she asked around in her circle of friends that there was a very large population of Jewish people in southern Lebanon. They weren't as reluctant to talk with their Gentile neighbors as the Jews in Israel were. So maybe she asked her Jewish neighbors, tell me about your Messiah. Wherever she got her information, it's clear that she thought about Jesus because her swift reply reveals not just quick wit, but critical reflection. When Jesus rebuffed her, not once, not twice, but three times, she was undaunted. When Jesus told her, I'm only sent for the Jewish people, she was undeterred. Why? Because she had reflected on the Jewish Messiah and she had come to the conclusion and the conviction that if Jesus really was he, then he could help her and he would. She had reflected on Messiah and had come to the conclusion and the conviction that Messiah would eventually bless the whole earth. So why not start with the Lebanese? <laughs> Mega faith doesn't refer to the quantity of our faith. It refers to the quality of it. Mega faith is informed. It's heard about Jesus. It's intelligent. It's inquired further about Jesus. It's reflected critically. And it has reached faith conclusions and formed faith convictions. This is good preaching right here, by the way. You gotta listen again to know how good it is. <laughs> Back when Larry King was still on the air, I happened to catch him interviewing two different television preachers on two different occasions. The first was a famous, famous preacher. If I said his name, you would all know him. And Larry King asked the question, is Jesus the only way to heaven? And the famous, famous preacher choked on the question. He dithered a little bit here and there, and then he said, well, Jesus is the only way for me. You know, I, I don't really ever care to be interviewed on CNN, but if you are a famous, famous preacher... How do you sit down with Larry King not prepared to answer that question? The likelihood that it's going to come up is pretty much 100%. The second preacher was Franklin Graham. Larry King put the same question to him. Is Jesus the only way to heaven? And without skipping a beat, Franklin Graham launched into one of the most concise and gracious presentations of the gospel that I've heard. He said, you know, God has done the most loving thing he could ever do. He sent his only son, Jesus, to die on the cross. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And here's the thing that impressed me so much about Franklin Graham's answer. It wasn't contrived. It wasn't rehearsed. It wasn't engineered to walk the fence. It just flowed out of him intuitively. Franklin Graham's answer was the product of critical theological reflection. His answer revealed that he had come to faith conclusions and he had formed faith convictions. And that's just like this Lebanese mom's answer. She had thought a lot about Jesus. She had arrived at some faith conclusions about him. And she had formed some faith convictions. If he really is Lord, if he really is son of David, then there's no way that he won't help me. Indeed, Jesus said himself, whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. She had already reached that conclusion on her own. And out of her mouth came an unrehearsed reply that was not only witty, but it was full of informed and intelligent faith. So how does our faith measure up with hers? really doesn't matter how long you've had faith in Jesus. Maybe you were born into a Christian family. Maybe you were raised in the church. But what have you done with your faith? What have you done to inform yourself about Jesus? What have you done to inquire further about him? Have you reflected on him and drawn some faith conclusions? Are there some faith convictions in your heart? Peter says... Always be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks you 
Why are you so full of hope? Are you ready to face Larry King, this Lebanese mom? She was ready. What does a mom with mega faith show us? She shows us what mega faith is like. Number two, she shows us how mega faith manifests. She shows us how mega faith manifests. All right, I want you to all get the picture. I want you to, to kind of get into the story this morning. Here's poor Jesus. All he wants to do is rest on vacation. And this Lebanese mom on a mission shows up on his doorstep. I've had the privilege of traveling a little bit here and there. And one thing that strikes me is not how different people are, but how much alike people are. On every, on every continent, in every culture, in every climate, a mom on a mission is the same. Her little daughter was sick, tormented by an evil spirit. And this mom was determined to get help for her. Can I just pause to point something out to you this morning? Jesus commended this woman for having mega faith, but she still had problems at home. Beloved, listen to me. You can have mega faith and still have some problems at home. You can have mega faith and, and still not be on the same page with your spouse. Where was her husband? Why, why wasn't he at her side? Why wasn't he there pleading with Jesus along with her. You can have mega faith and still have tension and strife at home. You can have mega faith and still someone in your house takes sick. You can have mega faith and one of your kids is in trouble. The enemy has one of your sons or daughters in his grip. Struggles at home don't mean that your faith is weak or that you have no faith. So watch how this mom's mega faith manifests. First of all, mega faith encompasses our whole being. What she shows us is that mega faith engages and energizes every part of us. Mega faith, it certainly does engage our intellect, but mega faith is also impassioned. It engages our emotions. Mega faith makes us determined. It engages our will. Mega faith energizes even our bodies. It, it, it causes our mouths to move. It causes our hands to move, our feet to move. So here's Jesus trying to rest. And the Bible says that this Lebanese mom outside kept on shouting and shouting and shouting. The, the verbs in Greek are continuous. That means the action keeps on happening. She kept on saying, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. But Jesus doesn't answer a single word. The church father Chrysostom wrote, Jesus, the word, had no word. Finally, the disciples can't take it anymore. They come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, send her away. She keeps on shouting at us. When Jesus didn't answer her, she started harassing the disciples. Get him to help me. Get him to help me. I'm in agreement with the majority of commentators who believe that what the disciples meant was, Lord, heal her already and send her away in peace. That they had never seen Jesus not help someone. Come on, Jesus, let's get it over with. Heal her so we can get back to chillaxing. The Bible says that the disciples, again, it's a continuous verb, kept on urging him, send her away, send her away, send her away. So I want you to get the picture. Jesus is on vacation, and outside is a screeching woman who won't shut up, and inside are 12 complaining men who won't shut up. You ever have a vacation like that? It's like the old Beach Boys song, I want to go home, let me go home. This is the worst trip I've ever been on. I have to tell you, I understand my father so much more after I became a father myself there's been a few family vacations where I've said I get you dad I, I get you now do you know the Bible says there's going to be a half hour of silence in heaven 
Do you know who that's for? It's for Jesus. It's for every Christian man who ever said on vacation, all I want is a half hour of peace. Just one half hour, just 30 minutes. One screeching woman and 12 complaining men and the word has no word. Matthew uses continuous verbs uh, uh, for the screeching and the complaining and Jesus' silence. So apparently this standoff went on for a little while. Why is Jesus silent? Jesus was not uncaring. He was not cruel. I would suggest to you that Jesus was drawing out the faith of both the woman and the disciples. The Bible says that silence was his answer. Sometimes when God is silent, we think he hasn't answered. Silence is his answer. He's trying to draw something out out of us she had mega faith on the other hand Jesus often chided the disciples for having too little faith it's not the quantity of faith it's the quality of faith based on the very little she knew about Jesus she was convinced about him but based on the much that they knew they still weren't so sure finally Jesus breaks his silence and he speaks to the disciples but his comment was meant to be overheard by the mob. Do you ever have somebody do that? Do you ever have somebody make a sideways comment? They address a third party, but they're really zinging you. For our first 11 years here in Greenwich, we lived in places where we had to park on the street. I pray for all of you who have to park on the street. Our first apartment was in the second floor of a two-family house. So for six years, we parked on the street. And then we bought our own little house, and, and it didn't have a driveway. So we were on the street again for five more years. I love the parsonage. You could pa park 12 cars in the driveway down the street of the parsonage. We, we lived on a very busy little street, the house that we owned. And, and the man across the street had a landscaping company, and he had huge trucks that he parked out on the street. And it was very hard to get parking. One morning I came out my front door and my next door neighbor was in her yard and she yelled across the street to the landscaper, it's too bad that the neighbors around here have to call the cops on one another about parking. Apparently somebody had called the police complaining about the landscaping trucks and she thought it was me. I'm a little slow on the uptake, but I, <laughs> I realized that she had made a comment to him, but it was meant for me. So I trotted across the street, and I said, Richie, I said, I, I didn't call the police on you. I would never do that. And he said, I know, Pastor. He said, I know if you had a problem, you'd talk to me man to man. By the way, Richie could break me in half. <laughs> Jesus addresses the disciples, but his comment is meant for the Lebanese mom. I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus is revealing that his ministry, his earthly ministry, was limited in scope. First of all, it was limited by his human body. He could only minister to so many people. He could only minister in, in a body of human flesh. He could only minister to as many people as he could reach. He said to the disciples, after I'm gone, the things that you've seen me do, ye shall do, and greater than these. He didn't mean greater in quality, but greater in quantity. It's pretty hard to improve on raising a dead man who's been in the grave for three days. I don't know qualitatively how much greater than that you can do, but Jesus was limited by his reach. Now he has two billion disciples around the world to do greater works, greater in number. Secondly, Jesus' ministry was limited by the Father's plan of salvation. God's plan was for salvation to come to the Jews first and then to the rest of the world. God did have a plan to bring salvation to the Lebanese people and all people, but it wasn't quite time yet. Jesus gave this answer because he wanted to see both what the disciples would do and the mom would do with his answer. Maybe the disciples were satisfied with that, but not the mom on a mission. She shows us that that faith encompasses our whole being and she shows us that mega faith is creatively determined. 
Maybe the disciples would take no for an answer, but not this mom. She approached Jesus and she began worshiping him. The verb in Greek means she kept bowing down again and again and again. She was on her knees and she kept pressing her forehead to the ground in front of Jesus again over and over saying, Lord, help me, Lord, help me, Lord, help me. Beloved, sometimes we cry out to the Lord for help and it seems that the only answer we get is silence. The word has no word for us. But listen to me this morning. Someone, you received this. This is a word from heaven for you. When God is silent, worship him. When God is silent, enter into his presence, giving him the glory that is due his name. When God is silent, call on his name. This mom only knew two titles for Jesus, but she believed them with all of her heart. We know a lot more than two titles, but are we convinced as she that God is able to do what his name promises? When God is silent, worship him. Worship Jehovah Jireh when you need provision. Worship Jehovah Rapha when you need healing. Worship Jehovah Shalom when you're anxious and you need peace. Worship Jehovah Nisi when you're under attack and you need a shield. Worship Jehovah Mekadashikem, the Lord our sanctifier, when you need freedom from sin. Worship Jehovah Shama when you're struggling with loneliness. The Lord is with us. Worship Jehovah Jehovah Ra'a, the Lord is my shepherd. When you need guidance, worship Jehovah Sidkanu, the Lord is my righteousness. When the enemy tells you you're not worthy. When God is silent, worship him. Enter into his presence, calling him by name, believing that he is more than able to do what his name promises. Finally, Jesus speaks directly to the mom. He says it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Just a side note, this passage certainly means that Jesus spoke Greek as well as Aramaic. This is just a little, this is free, just for those of you that enjoy this kind of stuff. She was a Greek-speaking woman. She surely did not know Aramaic and Jesus was conversing with her directly, which means he was speaking to her in Greek. So Jesus was not a dummy, all right? He also answered Pilate in Latin. We'll get to that later. It's impossible to understand Jesus' answer here without understanding a couple things. First of all, the, the Christian writer, Max Lucado. Max Lucado has such a beautiful piece of writing on this story in the Gospels. Max Licato says it's impossible to understand Jesus' answer to this woman unless we understand that Jesus knew how to smile. Jesus was not being cruel to this woman. He was being playful. He had a twinkle in his eye. He, he had a curl of a smile in the corner of his mouth when he gave this answer. Second, it's impossible to understand Jesus' answer and, and her retort unless we understand Middle Eastern Proverbs and Middle Eastern banter and Middle Eastern bartering. What sounds to our Western ears like an insult was to her Eastern ears an invitation to enter into negotiation. Jesus' answer was a proverb that speaks to the subject of priorities. It's true that the Jewish people referred uh, pejoratively to Gentiles as dogs. The reason for that is that Jews kept kosher and Gentiles did not keep kosher. So Gentiles ate anything like a dog eats anything. But, but that is not the word that Jesus uses here at all. Jesus uses a word for a dog that means a small little house pet, a little lap dog, a, a beloved member of the family, albeit a four-legged one. To give the children's bread to a dog is a proverb. It means your priorities are out of whack. It means you're not taking care of business in the right order. In our house, our three kids get three square meals a day. Mommy sees to it. 
Our dog, Jack the Mangy Beast, on the other hand, gets fed when someone finally remembers. My mother-in-law used to get so mad. She's a great lover of dogs. She used to say, I wouldn't want to be a dog in this house. <laughs> Every morning, now you're looking at me, you know, all pious, but I know you do the same thing. Every morning and every evening, the question goes out in our house, did anybody feed the dog? Children's first, dog's second. That's the order. Jesus' answer to this Lebanese mom was very much like his conversation to the Samaritan woman at the well. Woman, salvation is from the Jews, but the time is coming and now is when they who worship him will worship him in spirit and in truth. His answer to her means your time is coming, but it's not here yet. That's when this mom's mega faith gave a reply that was creatively determined. She took Jesus' own words and she preached them right back at him. Don't you hate it when people preach your own words back at you? My kids preach my own words back at me all the time. They catch me doing something and they say, Dad, you preach this. Lately, the board has been preaching my own words back to me. I have to say the last six months have been some of the most challenging. They've been the most challenging of our 21 years here. And we've met for board meetings and, and wondered what to do. And the, then the board starts preaching faith back to me, like from my sermons. The mom preached Jesus' own word back to him. Yes, Lord, I, I understand what you're saying. I understand that there's an order to things. I understand that there are priorities. But while the children are being fed, there's still scraps for the dogs. I understand, Lord, that God has a plan. But while you're here, you can still toss me a little bite. There's plenty for everybody. You are Lord of all the earth. You care for everyone under your roof. The children of privilege as well as the little house pets. You are the son of David who has come to establish a worldwide kingdom of God's blessing. And while you're right here with me, you can hand me a little crumb. It was an answer that was not only witty, but it was full of deep conviction about Jesus. Jesus didn't hate it. He loved it. It moved him deeply. He said, oh, woman, you have mega faith. Request granted. And at that instant, the woman's daughter was healed at home. What does this mom with mega faith show us? She shows us what mega faith is like. She shows us how mega faith manifests. And finally, she shows us what mega faith receives. Everybody listen. I'm going to give you three quick things and we're done this morning. Three quick things. What does mega faith receive? First of all, mega faith appropriates blessings that belong to a future era now. Let me say that again. Look at me and don't miss this point. Mega faith appropriates blessings that belong to a future era now. How many of you remember that just before Jesus started his public ministry, he went to a wedding with his mother? And at the wedding, the, the young couple ran out of wine for the reception. And Mary came to Jesus and she said, do something. And Jesus said, Mom, my time hasn't come yet. It's, it's not time for me to start. It was a little premature. It, it's not time for me to start working miracles. But, but his mother prevailed on him to release a miracle. Jewish moms are good for that. In the same way, this Lebanese mom persuaded Jesus to release a blessing to her prematurely. In the plan of God, the gospel would come to the Lebanese people. After Jesus was crucified and risen again, Peter would come to Lebanon full of the Holy Spirit and he would start a great revival in the name of a soldier's house called Cornelius. But it wasn't time yet. It was a little premature. It was a little early. But the mega faith of this mom, it secured a crumb prematurely. 
Beloved, listen to me. Not too long now and another era is set to begin. In that era, there is no more pain. There is no more tears. There is no more sickness. There is no more death. In that era, there is no more sin. There is no more racism. There is no more oppression. There is no more crime or conflict or war. In that era is the restoration of all things. In that era, Jesus is is Lord and there is no challenger there is an era coming it's already begun but it's not yet come but by mega faith we can appropriate some of the blessings of that era now do you know what this story tells us this story tells us that healing is the children's bread And by faith, we can appropriate healing now. Freedom from the enemy's harassment is the children's bread. And we can appropriate it now by faith. Freedom from dysfunction, freedom from addiction is the children's bread. And we can appropriate it now. Answered prayer is the children's bread. Peace in your home is the children's bread. A half hour of silence and a happy family vacation is the children's bread. And you can appropriate it now. Healthy, happy. I'm preaching better than you listening right now. I'm just telling you. Maybe they'll listen better in the next service. Healthy, happy, holy sons and daughters is the children's bread. Blessed future generations of your family is the children's bread. And we can appropriate it now by faith. What does mega faith receive? Mega faith appropriates future blessings now. Number two, mega faith turns buts into thens. In this story, there's a but, but, but. The mom kept on screeching and screeching, but Jesus didn't answer. The disciples started complaining and complaining, but Jesus answered, I've only been sent to Israel. The woman kept on bowing and pleading, Lord, help me, Lord, help me. But Jesus answered, it's not right to take the children's bread and give it to the dogs. And then the woman demonstrated mega faith. Yes, Lord, But even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And then Jesus said, woman, your request is granted. Her faith turned but, but, but into a then. Her faith turned delays into a divine dispatch that brought deliverance to her daughter. Her faith turned denials into it's done, woman. Beloved, I have a word for someone today. Maybe like this Lebanese woman, you've been petitioning God and petitioning God for a breakthrough. And so far it has been but, but, but. Maybe you've been petitioning God, but there has been no word from the word. Maybe you've been petitioning God, but you've been delayed again and again. Maybe you've been petitioning God, but you've been denied. Listen, when God is silent, worship him. Inform your faith. Learn his titles. Call on him by name. Pray God's word back to him. Jesus, you said healing is the children's bread. You said answered prayer is the children's bread. You said peace in my home is the children's bread. Press into Jesus with mega faith. And I want to tell you, I speak over you, 2018 is going to be the year that your but, but, but becomes a then. What does mega faith receive? It appropriates future blessings now, turns butts into thens. And finally this, everybody listen, 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 and we're done. I know it's long, we're done. Mega faith releases seasons of blessings on our households, on our community, and on our entire region. You must listen to this. Ladies of this church, you listen to this because there's a word from the Lord for our women. This mom was a door opener. Her mega faith was a door opener. I believe God is going to use the faith and he's going to use the prayers and the intercession of the women of this church to be a door opener. Her faith in Jesus opened the door to revival in her entire community. 
It opened the door to revival in the entire region. Don't have time to read the last 10 verses of Matthew 15. You should read them later at home. But, but something amazing happened. Wasn't Jesus the one who said, I've only been sent to Israel? Wasn't Jesus the one who said, it's not right to take the children's bread and give it to the dogs. It's not time yet. It's, it's not the Father's priority yet. Wasn't Jesus the one who said it? But after this woman got a scrap from the table, after this woman exercised mega faith, it opened up the entire region. Jesus spent the next three or four months ministering to Gentile people in Gentile lands. They brought great numbers of lame and blind and crippled and deaf mutes. And Jesus healed them all. And Matthew says that the Gentile people praised the God of Israel. One little dog got a scrap of the children's bread. And now Jesus is distributing the children's bread to the Gentiles by the handful. His final act before crossing back into Galilee and going to Jerusalem was to miraculously feed a huge crowd with seven loaves and a few fish. Matthew says there were 4,000 men plus women and children. How big was that crowd? I don't know, 12,000, 16,000, maybe 20,000. All of them were Gentile people, but they ate the children's bread until they were fully satisfied and there were seven basketfuls left over. They ate the children's bread all because one little house dog, because one little mom on a mission had mega faith. Listen to me, women. This is for everybody. It's for the men and the women. But women, I just feel this from the Holy Spirit. Listen to me. You get one little scrap by faith of the children's bread. And it's going to open the door to your household. It's going to open the door to your community. It's going to open the door to this region. And God's going to start handing out handfuls of the children's bread so that people who have never tasted will eat and be satisfied. I want to tell you this in closing. Phase two is not for us. Listen, it is not for me. It is not for Glenn Harvest. And I took a cheap shot from someone this week. Oh, I'm glad you got that big fancy building as if I'm building it for myself. It's not for me. It's not for our church. It's not for our comfort. It's not for our convenience. It's for our community. It's for our region. So that our faith in finishing this building will be a door opener. So that thousands and thousands and thousands of people that live here can eat the children's bread and be satisfied. A mom with mega faith. She shows us what mega faith is like, how mega faith manifests, and what mega faith receives. Would you stand on your feet? I'm going to give Jesus, Lord, Son of David, would you give him a big praise in this place today?